Welcome to the Weekly Trend, a podcast for navigating the markets through the lens of technical analysis. The Weekly Trend podcast is provided for educational purposes only and does not constitute any professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the information or content without first seeking advice from a registered financial planner. Welcome back to the Weekly Trend podcast. Today is Friday, June 30th, 2023. S&P 500 is currently sitting at 4453. I'm David Zarling. I'm here with full-time money manager and part-time landscaper, Ian McMillan. We're heading into a 4th of July type weekend. Market will still be open partially on Monday, but plenty to talk about this week. Where would you like to start, Ian? Yeah, another pretty strong week so far. Obviously, two hours before the close, but yeah, can't complain. I mean, a pretty strong June, right? This is the last day of the month. Pretty strong month overall. It's pretty strong into the month, which is nice to see. End of the quarter. It's half the year has gone by. Can you believe that? It's crazy. Fourth of July happens, and then it'll be Christmas. Feels like that. You got landscaping to get done. Uh, Yeah. Got a phone call earlier. My mulch delivery has been delayed, so I'm not super stoked about that. But Oh, no. I know. It's okay. Okay. You've got mulch being delivered. Kevin's got drywall being delivered. You guys are busy. We are busy. I like it. Very productive. All right. We kind of saw a short term top back in the middle of the month, like the 15th or the 16th. The SP back to above that level. So new highs for the year. We continue to hold above 4,300. Clients will know all this. There's a market letter that think went out either yesterday or today right and so we're above 4100 or 4180 we talked about that forever so we've had a very strong push after finally breaking that level and we talked about being so important and that would you know kind of let us know if the market indeed had the strength to go higher and it's that was at the beginning of the month so kind of had a breakout and retest. And then, I mean, from June 2nd onward, here we sit on June 30th, a six and a half percent rally. You're right, Ian. I'm looking at this. The beginning of June is when we broke above 4,180 on the S&P. Yeah. And zoomed right through the August of 22 highs on the S&P. Tried to give it a go there, like May 18th, a little fake out. I remember that very vividly. I remember selling little bit on the 23rd and then on may 26th we get back above we buy it all back we get the retest bounce and yeah it's been a nice all rally. That, all that's left is demand right how many times we knocked up against supply i mean that's why we use charts because we can visualize where the sellers are which was at 4180 i mean there's a reason it's not just a you know a, a lottery machine where we pick out a number on why that's important. It's because sellers showed up at 4180 at that level, June of 22, August of 22, November of 22, February of 23, and a little bit of May. And then we we break above there. And it's kind of like, how many times can you knock on the glass before it gets broken? We've broken above that. Clients are familiar with the letter we sent back in March that it was a three-step process. We needed to stay above a 200-day moving average. Check. Mm-hmm. Above 4180, check, stay above 4180. And I would say at this point, with a monthly candle like this, that we're going to check that box. And like you said, there's another client update coming out today or tomorrow. So clients should be looking for that in their inbox. But and how about this? So, right, we also, another thing we have talked about. Theme of the year, theme of the first half of the year has been this large cap, mega cap. Oh my God, Apple's at a $3 trillion market cap. You know, all of this talk, not just at Microsoft, NVIDIA, Meta, all of that, right? And so you and I just got done talking about what a strong last month we've had. The NASDAQ actually underperformed both the S&P and the Russell 2000 this month. Fascinating. I don't think that's coming as a surprise from what we've talked about in the past, the level that, for example, IWM versus SPY or small caps versus the S&P, it's the COVID level. So it's a behaviorally important level in the relationship. And could you see 
and small caps as a whole on an absolute basis holding the COVID highs going all the way back to 2020, <laughs> does the summer of 22 into the summer of 23 actually turn out to be accumulation similar to how basically February of 21 through February of 22 was distribution? I don't see a lot of faults with that thesis. And I think IWM has, I think it really stepped up this week. So back again, early June, we had the breakout above 180, right? That's a very clear base. Nice rally. We came back again, peak middle June. We come back to retest 180, also where the 200-day moving average sits. And then a very, very strong week right off of that. We should clear those highs today so certainly some beta there but i'm proud to have such a strong month and for it not to be led by these you know how everyone at the five stocks or the seven stocks right we've seen all the data so this year and there's truth to the data i mean there is mathematical truth and we've talked about it on this podcast when we talked about, oh, you know, without these seven stocks, the S&P would be down for the year. And this was what, like maybe a month or so ago. I think it's right after, basically, if you if you think about the year as it unfolds, we have the triple breath thrust in January <sighs> and February. And then you have a breath, a retreat or rug pull in March that's led by the mini banking crisis. And during that period, basically March, April, May, it was the top 10 stocks in the S&P that were carrying the load, but also being aware, you know, I remember you and I talking, I don't know, four or five episodes ago about it would be perfectly healthy to rotate into small caps. And here we are. Here we are. And you're seeing things out of a lot of different places now, other than tech, our industrials and discretionary led for the month. So yeah, not exactly bearish, right? The retail theme is there and within industrials, and you had a you and I had a good conversation with, about this before we hopped on transports. Yeah, and with inside of that trucking. So when you look at your ODFLs and your SAIAs and your XPOs. If you're new to the podcast, those are tickers, that's old Dominion. I actually don't know if you say SAIA or if you say SIA. I don't know. I say Saya, but I, I, I think it's I, on I think the road all the time. I don't XPO. know how to say it. It's like an Optima Optima thing. Optima Optima. Made up. VWAP. VWAP. Yeah. VWAP. Roof. Roof. Creek. Crick. Almond. Almond. I don't know how. I, I think in, in the South, don't you guys say, or is it almond that you guys say different? Is that yeah, not the right? Pecan. Pecan, pecan. Pecan. That's what it is. Thank you. Yeah. I'm on the wrong note. Well, and even I think it was me Schneider. She had a good piece out this week on it's really hard to be bearish if transports are leading. And I don't agree with that sentiment. Pretty important. I'd like to see banks do a little better. Your point is valid. I mean, XPO at new fresh highs, ODFL right at highs. You were talking about the credit cards before we got on here, right? Yeah. I mean, Visa and MasterCard both. I mean, Visa's base goes back to 21, MasterCard, I believe, fresh, new. Well, it's right there. It's right at this 393 level on MasterCard, huge level. And you mentioned just before discretionary leading. If you're sitting around the campfire this weekend and you're talking about discretionary and industrials and tech and trucking leading, those aren't boxes that you check for a bearish market. All right. Well, I see your discretionary and I raise you home builders. Mm. I mean, look at those things. Yeah, it's incredible. I and mean, okay, so let's talk about, you had a great point. Let's talk about rising rate environments and the thesis behind what it does to home builders versus an example you had brought up with Pulte Home in the last yeah. rising rate environment. What I love about Pulte Homes, that PHM, the ticker, I don't know if this brings, so there's weird things in life that bring you joy, Ian. For me, it's, wow, I've got a chart that goes back to the 70s. When you look at Pulte Homes, you know, one of the larger home construction builders out there, the late 
you know, in a rising rate environment, 1974 through the early 80s, right? We know that peak interest rates were early 1980s. You know, you had mortgage rates in the 17, 18%. And during a rising rate environment, you have something like Pulte Homes appreciating like 60,000%. I'm not saying that's what has to happen yeah. next, but. Well, and then what I love is it gets the block. So imagine, right? So rates roll over kind of early 80s, right? Yep. And this thing. So how ecstatic were people in the early 80s or rates? For, yeah, those, you know, 81, 82, 83. Oh, my God. Now I'm only paying 9% on my mortgage instead of 13. Again, not saying that that happens around, but again, these theories and theses about what rising rates do to home builders as a business and then how that some way is supposed to translate to their stock being weak um, might, ne might not necessarily be true. And we have seen that again across a plethora of home builder stocks, even as mortgage rates continue to rise. That doesn't fit conventional thinking right? That interest rates and mortgage rates rise, but home builders are going to do well. Well, we're market historians. We have proof from the past that that's possible. And same with the narratives of the last six months, whether it's the dollar collapse or the credit wall. I don't know if you've heard that phrase before, where like all these tech companies are bumping up. Against, yes, I see what you're saying. You know, like bumping up against like being able to raise funds. Yeah. But you have an ETF like ICVT. So Indigo, Charlie, Victor, Tango, that basically represents the credit, right? It's convertible bonds of some of these, you know, more risk on tiny tech startup names. And we're about to go out and do like a convertible bond for Arkish type stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. For like Arc Innovation. And here we are about to, on the verge of, at minimum 52 week highs, but about to break weekly and monthly above important levels on that. So there appears to be a broadening out happening. Let's just listen to things we're talking about. We're talking about Pulte Homes, Home Builders, Old Dominion, SIA, so transportation. We're talking about convertible bonds for tech companies. Like none of these things line up and say, oh, bearish. Well, okay, and let's look at the top holdings in this convertible bond. So Palo Alto Networks, I believe that's breaking the new highs. Royal Caribbean. Oh, shocking. MongoDB. I'm pretty sure MongoDB has been pretty strong. Yeah, I mean, real strong lately. Southwest, Carnival. Right, so these are, uh, I mean, Airbnb, Dish Networks on semiconductor and the list goes on and on these were the dogs ian these were the dogs of the correction yeah like, meaning like this is these are the things that got discounted 60 70 80 90 percent from mm -hmm. february of 21 through late last year and wouldn't you know it markets are truly a future discounting mechanism and so if the bond market and right we've talked about the bond market on this podcast i'm a firm believer that the bond market is probably a little bit smarter than the equity market could sniff things out a little better and to see an ETF, a basket with those types of holdings with a really beautiful chart breaking out. And it just so happens to coincide with, you know, ARC and ARC W and I think ARC F, which is the yep. financial, the financial tech, right? Financial tech. So I don't think it's a coincidence, going to be honest with you. And right. I think it's a confirmation. It's confirmation. Absolutely. If you've got credit markets confirming equity markets, right? This Because if we step back and remember what, why are there capital markets? Why are there credit markets? It's so these companies can raise capital to run their business. Go hire yeah. more people, research. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like this is why these things exist. And if we're seeing these things repair themselves, that's quality information. And financial technology, you mentioned, you know, ARC W, like 
next gen, like internet, things like that, whether you're looking at like PNQI, FDN, these are ETFs for internet. I think we mentioned tech before, even communication services. And now you're throwing in things like transportation and small caps. There definitely seems to be a broadening out that's happening and perfectly normal considering going back to your original point, the big boys holding ground during a brief pullback in March, April, and a little bit of May, there might be room to run. Was this the pullback? Was last week the pullback and that's it? That was the opportunity you had? That's your retest of 4,300. And again, one of these things where if you're not there on Monday uh, morning, it's tough. We have these run up. I think it's more of a bull market behavior and take IWM yesterday. Yeah. A huge oh, move. So essentially, if you weren't long the night before or got in at, you know, right at the open and you missed the first hour, IWM wasn't necessarily a gap, but it's the same type of behavior where if you're not there, you just feel so caught off guard and then they do it to you day after day. Well, and that's the other dynamic. When you look at market characteristics, so what kind of behavior do you see in a bear market? Yes, lower highs and lower lows, declining moving averages, but like you even have these intraday characteristics of, for example, in a bear market, many, many times you'll see a strong morning in a weak afternoon. We're seeing the flip side of that. Mm -hmm. We're seeing weak morning, strong afternoons. And now I think you just pointed to this strong mornings and strong afternoons. Yeah. Which I think there's a lot of catching up out there to be done with, and right? This, you bought into the narrative, bear market rally, economy stinks. Again, clients are very familiar. And this is why we ignore these things. Right. Right. Because int higher interest rates were supposed to be bad. And the narrative was that the Fed always messes up. Yeah. The Fed is always hard late. Landing. That's it. It's going to be a hard landing. Right. What if the Fed got it right this time? I have no idea, but all I know is. All I know is we're above 4,180 and then we were above yes. 4,300. And now we're going to close above the March 2022 highs today on the queues. And we've got Microsoft consolidating at all time highs. We have the most important stock on the planet, Apple, at all time highs. And on a, well, we won't know until later, but potential breakaway gap, which would be incredible if that's true that's now it could be an exhaust it could be an exhaustion gap at this point yeah now it could be an exhaustion gap like uh, we need to be open-minded i think that's a less likely scenario but it's there like if next week we leave an island and something like apple which just basically means we we reach this price and we gap below the the gap that exists on apple which is approximately near 189 190 if we're below that then yeah then we got some consolidation to do. Maybe yeah. it's some type of weird blow off top. But for XL, now, XLK right here, when we're back at 174, those were the all time highs from December 2021. If we consolidate here for, I mean, tech's on like a what, a 50% plus, we're a 54% run off the October lows in tech. If we consolidate here for a few weeks, a couple months, people need to understand that that's totally healthy. Yes, absolutely. You just got 56% run. Like the best case scenario, or maybe we break above and then consolidate. But if we look back at the end of the year and we are, when we alluded to this earlier, let's say these large and mega cap XLK type things spend the second half of the year sideways while, and this is kind of Ryan Dietrich's thesis, while small caps play quote unquote catch up, that would be perfectly normal, right? Through summer, through into fall, if that's what happens. Like maybe in 2024, large cap growth picks up again. I have no idea. But as it could definitely, you know, small caps could absolutely, they have some ground to make up and they seem kind of seem like they want to do it. Well, and what's fascinating is if you look at, you brought up, you know, tech and let's use XLK, gets above its August high does a, a tiny throwback, blows right through its March 22 high, and then goes right to right now, which would be near its previous, like its all-time highs was in the last part of 21. If that's the leader, and that's because a lot of times markets are fractal, and so the leaders out of here kind of set the pathway of how this looks going forward. 
are we seeing the same thing out of S and P where we just had our throwback above the August 22 highs? The okay. March 22 highs are at 4550, 40, 4600. Mm -hmm. Are we going to go directly there? That Good. would be, I know Katie Stockton's talked about that level. I mean, that, and there's this neckline from Q4 2021 at, you know, call it 4,500, 4,550. You, I mean, you pull up a chart as a technician. We know kind of the zone that's being discussed. Yeah, I mean, that's the next logical. And we got there because of the move we've had this week. I mean, we might get there sooner rather than later, but that's kind of the next logical stop. You know, to kind of see, okay, how do we play out when this gets here? One thing I wanted to ask, so we've talked a lot about what the strongest areas have been over the month of June. Mm -hmm. And so, right, we use that as evidence as to why, you know, the market has sustainability. But on the flip side of that, we also have areas that we want to look to for weakness. And would yeah. you say that we have seen that? Yeah, I mean, seeing utilities and staples be relatively weak, some parts of healthcare relatively weak. And, it, yeah. and the reason why I'm saying relatively is because maybe they're just treading water on an absolute basis. You know, you look at something like XLU representing utilities. It's at the same level it was at the beginning of 21. And what's interesting about that is I can also tell you that XLK is at the same level as it was at, in the beginning of 2021. But when you use charts, right, as chartered market technicians, understanding supply and demand visually, it's two different things. When you look at the chart, it's ex extremely two different things. And seeing XLU week, Staples week, those are defensive areas. That's where you go and hide. You know, if you've got a mandate at a fund and you have to be 98% invested, staples and utilities are two areas where you can potentially hide when markets are correcting. That's not happening right now. You know, it's Those funny are not really strong. that you bring that up is that I am in the midst of grading level three exams. One of my questions is about what sectors do you see, you know, like what's relatively strong? at the top of a bull market okay and so s some of those that you listed off are the answer right so if we're seeing right. them be relatively weak now we're using you know the textbook definition from the cmt exam then we're probably not at a bull market top a big thesis out there it's a big market rally and i think a few people, including Dietrich, have had good data on if this is a bear market rally, this is the strongest bear market rally we've ever had in history. If you have technology sitting right at its previous all-time highs, same with semiconductors, and at the same time, on a relative basis versus the S&P, they're at new and consolidating all-time highs, exceeding yeah. the 2,000 tops, that's extremely wow. important information. That's a great chart there, SMH versus S&P. Yeah, beautiful weekly consolidation above the 2,000 relative highs. And I love that you're grading those tests, and I think it's an important concept. These inter-market relationships. Very important. Very important. Love or hate or whatever CNBC, I'm not here to smash people, but it's really hard to manage risk and make investment decisions using CNBC or Yahoo Finance or and again I don't have a problem with these companies it's a free market you know we're celebrating independence this upcoming again, week the clickbait but, can be hard for some yeah but like in the end the chart is the chart and we get paid in price we don't get paid in opinions and when you see these type of behavior you do a deeper dive, right? You go beyond the sector level. And we talked about some industry level things like trucking and semiconductors and even like financials. So you look at like bellwethers, like JP Morgan. JP Morgan's right there. It's breaking out of a base. Right day. Goes, yep. And I'm not saying that JP Morgan is a relative leader. I'm just saying if JP Morgan is doing well, that tends to be, yeah, it just needs to participate. And so here you have all these pieces of evidence happening in the face of 
worry or I, I don't know what you want to call it. Worry, disbelief, massive Anything, shorting going on. All of the fear that gets, I think it's not even financial fear. It's just general fear, disbelief, scary stuff that gets put in front of people on a daily basis. And even when it's not financial, it, it bleeds into their mindset of, I'm not saying that I agree with everything that's going on in the world. I'm just saying it doesn't affect what goes on with the SP 500 or stocks. Or it doesn't affect market decisions because in the end, our clients are very familiar with the positions taken after we broke above 4180. Until we could prove that the sellers were gone, right? Because if we keep seeing law of supply and demand, more supply than demand, price drops. And if we keep seeing price drop below 4180, we know sellers have control. And now we don't see that anymore. And we could take positions based on that. I'm not sitting here saying that like our in-house performance was just amazing, like before 4180. I'm just saying that clients can now see, oh, okay, demand now has control of this market. Buyers have control of this market and we're positioned accordingly. And we're well, able yeah, to take advantage yeah. of some of You have a consolidation in broad market with broad indices with zero breadth. And now you can kind of move away from just saying, hey, I'm going to hang out here in the S&P and the NASDAQ until this gets better. And above 4180, we've seen that. Yeah, right. Correct. And And I'll still go back to the most important player in the league. Apple, and it's really hard to get bearish with Apple doing what it's doing, the things you highlighted with transportation and semiconductors. Sounds like the Atlanta Braves right now hitting on all cylinders. Dude, your Braves are smoking. On fire. Ronald King and Apple. Yeah, <laughs> he is. He's another level. He is, like, you watch him, he is another level. They're so, Yeah, they're having another, um, and they're right there at the race. Is knocked off the Mets. Well, and both teams are fun to watch. And, and you can thank me later for the Brewers taking three out of four from the Mets. You're welcome. That's what I was saying, yeah. Took very, very happy about that. They're like nine games under 500. Sorry to the Mets fans. But yeah, Braves are not missing a beat without Freddie or Dansby Swanson. So it's good to see. Well, yeah, isn't that crazy? Like you have two guys. And they're like, quality. Way up, like on the home run lead. I think I looked yeah. two days ago. They were at 142 home runs, and second place was like 117. Really? Yeah. They hit five just the other night in the series finale with they swept the Twins, who are in, I mean, they're in pretty weak division. Besides Acuna, who's carrying that home run load? Matt Olson. Okay. I mean, Azuna, which. Yeah, Azuna, that's an interesting. Like the fact that he's been able to survive despite his yeah. arm, arm issues. And other things. Big one was once Dansby leaves, what are you going to do at shortstop? Well, Arcia has come in. I mean, he's had a great year. I think he's at just six home runs, but I mean, he's batting like over 300. You know, that breaks my heart a little bit, right? About Dansby? No, Arcia. Orlando? Yeah. He was our brewer prospect of the future. And you know what was interesting about him is he well, didn't he have the out in Atlanta. So you guys oh. clearly had a decent farm system. And he he played for us for a couple of years. I believe he was in the Granky trade. I could be wrong about that. But anyway, you know what was amazing about him was he when we did make the playoffs, he was clutch. Like I believe his batting average with the Brewers in the playoffs versus regular season was like a hundred point difference. Anyway. Yeah, you know, there's some with you guys for a few years. Yeah, he's a dude, man. Like I always in, enjoyed him, but at the same time, I'm not going to complain. I love Adamus. Guy brings energy, but kudos to the yeah, Braves. We're in first place. We are. We got the Reds, but I would argue that the NL Central I'm is so a little bit. With the Reds. What's that? I'm just very unimpressed with the Reds. Oh yeah, they don't have a lot. But I know that they are, everyone's all about L.A. De La Cruz. Yeah, De La Cruz, and I get it. He's a dude, man. He's like legit. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, like you got a guy that can throw like he throws, the range that he can. I mean, he's got the five tools. 
But is it enough to carry the central? It might be because the central is pretty weak. But anyway, the point being, you've got these massive all-stars like Apple and Microsoft. And even like, you know, you look at something like Google in reclaiming important levels. These are really important stocks. And now you're going to have your other guys off the bench perform really well. It's a big deal. So if you look at a lot of charts, there's many stocks. I don't want to make it sound like the majority of stocks. I'm just saying there's many stocks that are setting up these multi-year bases. And I can use like, in full disclosure, right? Some of these might be held in the ETF, ADPV, Adaptive Select, but Hewlett Packard or AXTA. The E is breaking out of one. These are multi-year, some of them six, seven-year bases, which kind of make sense when you think about the past. So Volmageddon was the beginning of 2018. Yeah, January 2018. And we've had three 20-plus corrections during that period of time, so increased volatility. And what I mean by that is typically we experience one 20% correction every four and a half years, and here we've had three and five. And so you have all these bases setting up. Is this just the start? I, we don't know. This goes back to your point about price is price. It, above 4180, we can have a stance. Unless these bases break out, there's nothing really to be said, but there's plenty of bases sitting there where if we're breaking above important levels, I can use Toyota as an example or Japan as a whole. These are pretty large bases. Look, if you take NYSE composite, it's back to its neckline from 2020, 2021, early 2022. Yeah, that's a great chart. Right at, the 50, let's call it 16,000, right, right there. And that's had and then, polarity then, for the last two years plus. Yeah, I would say three years, right? Like two and a half? That's clearly, I just, I don't care what your MO is in the markets. I can get behind. I know we like to joke around or whatever about fundamental analysis and all that and listening to conference calls. And But I don't know how you can look at a chart of the NYA and that 16,000 level and tell me that that is random, that just trillions of dollars were traded. And yeah, that's just a random happens, walk. That just so happens to be where we continue to end up, whether it's above or below. And we're right back there again. You'll never convince me otherwise that that's just all the decisions that are made in markets on all the different beliefs. And they all show up on a price chart, right? Because that's what we all have to trade at the end of the day. Whether you came to your buy or sell conclusion to something else, you're still buying and selling at a certain price. Yep. So you're going to tell me that with, right? And we know, I mean, there's all across the world, trillions of dollars, millions of people interacting. And we keep it ending up here at 16,000 on this chart. Yeah, touching it about 13 times in a row. Yeah. And what's interesting, right? And I don't know if this is in CMT3, the test that you're grading, but we would call this polarity, right? Area where buyers have shown up in the past, we break below that level, and now this is where sellers show up. But here we are again. And how much information is it? Because in some ways, the NYA, the NYSE composite, I'm not saying it's more important than S&P. It's not because that's where your all-stars are. I'm just saying that if the NYSE is going to break above 16,000, like what evidence is left to be bearish? Yeah, I think you've gotten then air on the side pretty hardcore if you aren't there already. That this is a market where the average stock wants to go higher. And if the average stock wants to go higher, then the broad indices most likely probably want to go higher too. Which probably sees something like small caps using IWM, you know, testing the 200 level, maybe above it. You know, you brought up micro caps before, you know, maybe we're visiting IWC at 126. And we haven't even started talking about internationally. We talked about the Toyota a little bit or Japan, but there's areas internationally that I'm not saying internationally as a whole. Like I think before we jumped on the call or before we started recording this, we talked about China, which just doesn't seem to be able to get, gain traction. But there's plenty of other areas that are, whether it's Argentina, Greece, I mentioned Japan. There's 
other parts of the area. And, and, and when you think about like buying Japan, it's not really necessarily a risk off either. So what else, Ian? What else are we noticing, looking at? It could be crypto, commodities, bonds, volatility. Doesn't matter to me where you want to take this before we wrap it up. Yeah, volatility. VIX continues to move lower. I mean, we're going to end at not year-to-date lows, but pretty close today, it seems like. As long as we're below 15, got to, again, air on the side that it melts lower. It's just yep. a trend, right? Well, it's hard. If there's a lot of people caught short and their future buyers and this continues to melt up against them and you're forced to buy, price can move higher. And this doesn't change the thesis of prices moving higher, especially if we look out like 12 months from now, do stocks fall back below their you know 2021 highs? They could. That's a possibility. But if the VIX is going to you know melt like this, and be below levels that we haven't seen since the COVID panic crash, option premiums falling in price, that typically is indicative of prices moving higher. That's important information. Before we jump into the extended portion, I do want to highlight, Ian, that this episode is brought to us by the Adaptive Select ETF. Good yeah, for that. It is. And it's listed on the NYSE under ticker ADPV. Adaptive Select helps investors access two of the most prevalent factors in markets, momentum and relative strength. Through proprietary identification methods, the Adaptive Select ETF attempts to own the strongest 25 large cap stocks when the market is in an uptrend. And since not all market environments are the same, Adaptive Select seeks to prevent extended declines by moving to short-term treasury bills and cash during long-term market downtrends. Investors can find out more including how to invest in ADPV by visiting adpvetf.com or calling 1-833-880-5200. And as always, investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. Adaptive Select is distributed by Quasar Distributors, LLC. So one of the things, Ian, that I want to touch base on going into the past the client portion, of course, I'm not here to tell clients not to listen further, but in the extended portion of the podcast, I know you shared some important information, right? We just had a Russell 1000 constituency change. Oh, yes, we did. It's a big deal for us. Yeah. Can you walk us through? Our ETF chooses from a bucket of Russell stocks, Russell 1000. So I think that there were how many new additions? I think there was a swapping of about 25 to 33. Uh, I thought it was 25, 30-ish, yeah. Some of it was a delisting. I believe it was 25 were swapped. So 25 moved up from the Russell 2000, I think, right? Right. Yep. And then eight were delisted because of like acquisition or takeover. And this this reconstitution takes place once a year, correct? Yes, once a year. It's a pretty strict, much more strict than the S&P 500. That's why we kind of chose this bucket of stocks over something like the S&P 500, it's pretty cut and dry. Either you're in the thousand largest market cap or you're not. Yep. Is there anything that sticks out to you in some of the constituency change, right? Because I mean, the Russell 1000, what I love about it, right, is typically 99% of the time, if you end up in the S&P 500, you came out of the next 500. Yes. It's not like you just skip over that 500 to get to the S&P 500. And S&P 500, as we all acknowledge, is one of the best investment, whether it's cap weighting or momentum, however you want to describe it, one of the best indices on the planet. Anything that sticks out to you from the Russell 1000 constituency change of those 25 stocks that you think are worthwhile? And it, there could be nothing. It could be just, hey, this one sector is now favored more. This industry is now favored more. Anything stick out to you? One of the things that always... so perks my interest is how they treat growth and value. So that doesn't necessarily have an impact on the bucket of stocks the ETF chooses from because it's, you know, it's going to be growth or value, it's just whatever makes it up, but how they split that underneath. And the biggest change was communication services 
had a massive jump from value into growth. What they consider communication services had been considered value and is now considered growth? Yeah, and it had the biggest. It was about an 8% jump. Wow. That's pretty big. It is. And when I think of communication services, I think, and maybe I'm going to show a little bit of my ignorance here, right? When I think of calf-weighted, which is not what you're talking about, I think of Google and Meta. Are there, of those 25, is that where the change comes from? Is the 25 or is it a weighting thing? Is it like some of the... I think it's, it's a... Maybe well, whatever both. they just decide, right? Because S and P earlier this year they decided that value is now growth. It's been energy for my entire career. Our energy has been value for my entire career, and now they decided energy is growth. <laughs> so I don't know if it's again. I like to look at the Russells a little bit more literal. And the S and P, I don't know what those dudes do behind closed doors. They must get <laughs> drink with the people from the Dow. Because I really don't understand some of their decisions. The Russell, they're over in London. So maybe they're kind of like, so they steer clear of all the shenanigans. What if they make their decisions at breakfast and the rest are making the decisions after happy hour? I'm not sure. This particular, the people at the Dow are definitely making some decisions after they've had tied a few on. But <laughs> was there something that stood out to you? No, it was the same thing as you, just the communication services weighting increasing and again when we talk about the russell 1000 we're still talking about a cap weighted indice mm-hmm. and so those things have an impact and i do think i wonder if we'll look back in five to ten years and look at this swapping of growth to, or value to growth it's interesting short answers not really nothing really kind of surprised me or stuck out other than the chart itself like if you take an equal weighted russell 1000 Super fascinating that we're holding the COVID highs and that we could just be starting the coming out of a basing process that goes on for, right? Because the longer the base, the higher the space. If we've been basing for a full year and now we're going to break higher in that, how much, how much broader is participation going to get? I don't know, but I know that something like EQAL above its current levels is pretty healthy information for the top thousand stocks in the market and even better if we're above something like 44 bucks so no nothing really stuck out to me i just know that an equal weighted russell 1000 does a pretty good job representing broadly what's going on even better than s&p like you were saying yeah anything else we're kind of bumping up against the end of our time anything else you want to no highlight or right now the trend continues to be up it was another strong month not saying that there can't be any type of correction or consolidation soon, but all we have is the price data we've been given through June thirtieth. So, exactly, we can only be we can only be dealing with information that's been given. We completed those three steps that we sent to clients back in March. We continue to sustain trade above important levels on broad indices like the S and P five hundred. I think Ian brings up a good point about the NYA or NYSE composite. If we're above that, I believe it was 16,000 level, we're above that on something like the NYSE. I mean, how much more bullish is that? We continue to see areas of credit hold up well. And if we're going to have a strong summer, how much more does that bode towards a strong fall? It's typically right about here in July, we see a flattening out and digestion or a consolidation in markets. And I can't sit here and say that wouldn't happen, but that would be healthy as well. But here we head into a low volume week and the week of 4th of July. Sometimes you see some interesting developments over low volume weeks as far as like false moves. But you could also see an amplification of melting. You know, when you talk like a melting up, if we have low volume next week and all of a sudden you've got the S&P 500 sitting at 4,600, 4,550, I wouldn't be surprised by that. But other than that, I'm looking forward to celebrating our nation's independence. I know you probably have some. Oh, yeah. We've already got fireworks on deck, man. Do you really? Uh, we've been shooting off fireworks for like two weeks. Not at night. I'm talking about like after dinner. We got this, some small ones for him mm-hmm. to enjoy. They only go about like four or five. How does, Connor, 
Uh, yeah, how does Connor like those? He likes them. Loves them. Absolutely loves them. As anybody yeah, should. He's stoked for 4th of July. We'll have to let him stay up a little later so he can enjoy them at night. Do you guys have like a pretty good fireworks show around Charlotte? They'll probably be doing some stuff at the neighborhood clubhouse that we'll be able to see. Love it. Maybe we'll walk up there. What about you guys? Yeah, we'll have them all over the place. The local communities around here, there's at least four. They'll do them on different nights, but maybe they won't. Maybe they'll all do them on 4th of July this week. But it's always a great time, a great time to reflect. You know, in my personal opinion, we live in the greatest country of the world. And the fact that people would sacrifice so we could have that means a lot to me. And I was like, throwing a quote out there. And so this is from Benjamin Franklin regarding in being independent. Freedom is not a gift given to us by other men, but a right that belongs to us by the laws of God and nature. Whether you love or hate Benjamin Franklin, I think that statement's appropriate. We hope everybody has a wonderful holiday over this weekend. Markets will be open part of the time on Monday. And I know we'll be sitting in, making sure we're doing our job, managing risk, But Ian, I appreciate you and I hope everybody has a wonderful 4th of July. Yeah, have a great weekend, everyone.